I just came back from Baltimore this afternoon. Uh, rather interesting. The plane, we loaded on the plane, and, uh, and we sat, and we sat, and we sat a long time. And finally, they pushed the plane out, and we started taxiing out, get out to the runway, and they said, well, folks, we've got a little problem. We can't pressurize the cabin. The air conditioning's not working right. We knew that. We were already sweating. And uh, so we have to go back in and get it fixed. So we were over an hour and a half late leaving Baltimore. It was strange, though. While I was sitting waiting for the plane, uh, a good brother, Ivory Hopkins, a black pastor from Delaware, I've been knowing for quite a while, a deliverance, he and his wife walked into the waiting room, their plane had been canceled that they were supposed to go to Los Angeles on, and so they were on this, they were rerouted to this flight, and he walked in and said, well, hi, and we had a good chance to visit, found out he's still staying by the stuff, he's been kicked out of two churches and a denomination because of deliverance, he's kind of paid his dues, and uh, now he's, his church is growing steadily, and they're uh, plowing into deliverance full speed, he's going out to help Rudy LeBlanc and that group in Eagle Rock going out there for a meeting and uh, but we did get finally get uh, on our way to Chicago and we landed I think we must have dropped the last eight foot it was like a rock I've never hit the ground so hard in my life <laughs> we really banged the enemy must have been upset about something looking back on the Baltimore meeting he well might have been upset because uh, we had tremendous meetings thank you for your prayers uh, brother John Smith is a plumber he does plumbing to make expenses so he can do what he likes to do, which is preach and do deliverance. And he's got a strong deliverance church in Baltimore. And they've tried everywhere in the world to stamp him out and push him out and, and cuss him out and everything else. And he just keeps on going. And uh, we had a real tremendous meeting. I guess one of the best meetings we've had in Baltimore this last time. The Lord really did bless. There's an awful lot of witchcraft in that area. Uh, you know who Maryland was ma named after, and uh, there's a lot of witchcraft in the area, and a lot of it's aimed at that little deliverance church. But we uh, saw the tremendous breakthroughs, and the devil was uh, discomfited, put to flight, et cetera, et cetera. You know the rest of it. There were screaming demons all over the place last night. And we were doing a mass, the only kind of mass a Baptist preacher conducts, a mass deliverance. And when I had anorexia, it would have done your heart good to heard the screams all over the building. <laughs> so, uh, and there were some others screaming as well. But praise the Lord for victories won. And your prayers made all this possible. There was an awful lot of pressure. I knew that we were, had to be doing some good because there was so much pressure night and day. It was not an hour that there wasn't tremendous spiritual and phys physical pressure coming against me there so I knew we had to be hurting the devil quite a bit so praise the Lord pray for the Jakarta trip I'm sure the devil's not too happy about that one either and uh, it's not too far off the 15th of June we'll fly to Hawaii and have meetings there and then fly on to Jakarta Indonesia which is a hundred percent witchcraft and uh, so just pray that God will open the doors the Lord has also opened the doors to Mexico in December. I had a missionary call me and ask me, could I possibly come down? He's outside of Mexico City, 30 miles or so. And uh, somebody Norman Parrish had been in contact with. And he said, we need deliverance desperately down here, brother, and we're working on it, but we need some more help. So the Lord willing, I'll be going down there in December. So. The Lord is opening doors, there's no doubt about that, and, and the devil's getting smack old. But everywhere I go, I hear about these preachers, and I'll tell you, I just get angry. And I hate to be up here raving and screaming about the sorry preachers, but I'll tell you, sometimes it comes in handy to be going verse by verse through Isaiah. Take a look at, <laughs> take a look at chapter 58, where we're beginning tonight. We've been going through several chapters in Isaiah, one after the other, and guess where we landed on? Cry aloud, spare not, 
lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. I do not believe the number of people who claim the title of reverend, pastor, or whatever, and uh, who are doing little or nothing for the kingdom of God. They're feathering their own nest, and that's about all you can say for them. We had some people get upset in the meeting. <laughs> they came from a school of the prophets someplace. And I didn't know, I didn't even know they were there. The Lord knows my heart. I didn't know they were there. And I said some dreadful things that just really upset the apple cart with them. Of course, they should have not been sitting in the middle of the highway when the truck came through, that's all. I mean, these people that are always squawking, well, you hit me, well, they ought to get out of range. If they're not doing these stupid things, these anti-scriptural things, these unscriptural things, there'd be no need for them to be upset. I mean, if, if, if the Roman Catholic Church didn't teach idolatry and worship of images, there'd be no reason for them to get upset when I raved and ran about a wooden statue crying tears and branded as a demonic manifestation, which is all it is. I believe it's real. I saw the tear come down the cheek and come off the chin, and I saw a man stand there, and he said, I tasted it. It was salty. I'm surprised he'd be able to drink anything after tasting that beautiful tear. So sacred. Isn't it pitiful how horrible people get wrapped up in doodads? And God is saying, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. So what do you hear in every church? You don't have any demons. Why, you couldn't have any demons. We're just doing fine. We're building our third building in three years. Of course, we've got it mortgaged up to the 2050, but, you know, we've got it. My, my, my. My Bible says, cry aloud, spare not. God's going to get some people's hides. If you're not going to produce, you better just don't carry the name. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. They're going through the religious mill, if you please. Would you look at these people? Now these are the ones he says, cry aloud and show them their transgression, their sins. Who is it? Though they're seeking him daily. They delight to know my ways. They can't hardly wait to get in a Bible class. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of God, they ask of me the ordinance of justice. What does God want done? They don't plan to do anything about it, but they'd like to know what he wants. And they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. He said, you have not been fasting for the right things. You have been coming to church for the right things. You have been studying for the right things. Did you know you can, you can be in a religious merry-go-round? and go so hard and so fast till you won't have time to get an adequate rest and still not be pleasing God? Years ago when I was in Southern Baptist ranks, you know, the Baptists uh, down south especially, they, they love to have meetings. I mean, they figure if you've got to go in church, the light's got to be on every night. Church, somebody's got to be meeting and doing something. And they got to go here and go there and do this and do that. They're very busy with all kinds of good religious things. And I'll, they told the story about one lady who got saved in a Baptist meeting down there, and they said, well, would, sister, would you like to unite with our church? She said, oh, no, I'm not physically able. She didn't think she could keep up that pace they had, that frantic pace of going, going, going all the time, going to meetings, going here, going there. 
You see, there's nothing wrong with going if it's what the Lord wants. But are you aware that you can get caught up in a hullabaloo of going and doing and not be doing anything at all that pleases God? That's what these folks were doing. And the way you do it, you do it for wrong motivation. God is looking for motives. He's looking for the why you do it. If you study the Bible so you can be smarter than the rest of those turkeys down there at the church, you can impress those dummies, their superior knowledge, that's wrong motivation. And I don't care if you can spout the Bible like an angel. It's totally flat and no good. Somebody else that can't even uh, speak proper grammar and get up and cry through a verse and have the whole congregation under the power of God without even half trying because they're not trying to impress anybody. That verse really means something to them. It wasn't learned as some kind of a token of how smart I am, how spiritual I am, or something like this. You can, you can even get your life all straightened up and trued up and, and cleaned up and get your robes of righteousness on so that you're looking better than most folks and talking better, going better, and doing less and still be not pleasing God. If your motivation is to be better than other people around you. God challenges us constantly to examine our motives. Why are you doing this? Over the first chapter of Isaiah, he said, Why have you come up to clutter my courts? What are you messing up my church, my services for? You come dragging in and filling up the house. What would you do it for? I don't want you. It's a horrible thing to say. That's no way to build a big congregation, is it? It may not be a big one, but it'd be a dedicated one if they come because there's reality. And we need not to let any shallowness come into our worship. I have a message called the spirit of shallowness. And it's easy to slip over into shallowness and shallowly. You're doing things for shallow reasons. Doesn't compute. Now, he said, um, he said, they said, well, why don't you hear? When we fast and afflict our soul, we go through a great deal of problems. Fasting. Did you say fast? He said, yes, because you are finding pleasure and exact all your labors. In other words, you are so proud because you're fasting that's lost all the meaning. You know, the best fasting that you can ever do is when you just lose your appetite and you don't have to force yourself at all. You know, I've seen some people fast. They didn't call it that. I've gone into homes where there was a, a loss of a loved one. And those that were very close, they weren't hungry. They may have been big eaters ordinarily, but they just lost their appetite. They just were not hungry. They were just, it, food didn't interest them. The desire had just gone away. I've seen others who got under a heavy burden, prayer burden, for something they believed that God wanted prayed for, and their appetite just went and left. And they weren't aware of any, anything being a particular sacrifice. That's what God's talking about. He said, you fast for strife and debate. And I'm going to fast and pray so I'll have all the answers. I'll cram them down their throat the next time I talk to them and I'll make them back up and say, hey, you're right. You don't fast for that purpose. That's not the purpose of it. He said you fast for strife and debate. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They fasted twice a week. They tithed on everything and Jesus said these things you ought to do and not leave the weightier matters undone. The trouble was they were majoring on those things, those external things, but inside their heart and their attitude toward everyday life was rotten and ungodly. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? He said, you think because you're going through the motions, it's acceptable. 
it's very easy to get on the religious train and begin to do certain things and do them right. Did you know you can do religious things right? Look, look at all the things they were doing. Uh, they were bowing their head. They spread sackcloth and ashes. And they afflicted their soul, doing all the right things. But God said, that's not acceptable. Because the motive for what you're doing it for is wrong. And that throws out the whole thing. Now notice what he wants us to fast for. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Read it with me. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. What's God say? This is the fast that I have chosen. This is why I want you to become upset. This is why I want you to become uh, caught up and really dedicated in prayer to loose the bands of wickedness. Who's holding the bands of wickedness in place? Satan's forces? The demons? Are you familiar with them? You have a speaking acquaintance with them? Aren't they holding the bands of wickedness in place? They're holding the bands of wickedness around you, around your family, your job, your possessions. And you can expand it out. They're holding it around the government. They're holding it as far as you want to take it, aren't they? Aren't the demonic forces of Satan holding these things in place? Now, he said, if you want to choose the fast I have chosen, go on one to loose the bands of wickedness. Now you may very well want to choose some that are binding you first. It's good to be free, we say, isn't it? It's good to be free. And because actually the freer that you get, if you're seeking freedom so that you can serve God better, that's acceptable with the Lord. If you're seeking Bible knowledge in order to be better equipped to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, that's acceptable with the Lord. But if you're just doing religious things to be nice and to be noticed, then that's not acceptable. You see that God's looking for heart motivation? And he said, the fact, one of the fasts I chose is loose the bands of wickedness. And when I first started out, some of you got looked kind of dismayed, and you thought, well, gee, I won't get to pray for myself, and I sound like I've been pretty selfish. I've been concentrating on me and my family. No, no, wherever the bands of wickedness are, wherever those bands of wickedness are and wherever the Lord points them out to you so you can see them clearly, that's the ones you want to shoot at. Don't shoot over here in the tree where it's kind of vague and mystical because you don't know for sure what's up there. And that, get closer in and wait till the Lord shows you where the others are to shoot at. Don't waste your ammunition. Although you might give them a scatter shot every once in a while just to frighten them a little. But basically, it's good to zero in on the places that need it. And so to loose the bands of wickedness is one of the objects of a fast. And then to undo heavy, uh, to, to undo heavy burdens. Do you know anybody carrying a heavy burden? Now, the Lord designed us to carry certain burdens, and for those, he will give us strength. And there are certain burdens we're to carry alone. There are certain burdens that other believers are to help us with. And then there are burdens that the enemy has come up with. A number of times in deliverance, there's a spirit called false burden has arisen. The devil will slip in and play on your sympathies and put a false burden on you so that you'll waste a lot of time and energy and prayer and everything else over something that God really doesn't want you to carry. You see, God has designed you and given you the strength to carry and given me the strength to carry the burden that he wants us to carry. He didn't give you any strength to carry something else. And when you take it on yourself, that's why you have to be careful taking up another's offense. Did you ever read about that? Don't take up another's offense. You know, you hit my friend, so I'm mad at you. I'll take it up. I'll bust you in the teeth myself. They're too nice to hit you, but I'm not. I'll, I'll bust you. Mm -hmm. that's taking up another's offense now God didn't plan to help he didn't make provision to help you with that 
because he said that's not your job. To loose the bands of wickedness, undo heavy burdens. Now that, again, can be personal. Are you carrying heavy burdens? Are you carrying burdens that seem to be really demonic? Because actually, there's no particular virtue in you carrying them. Well, if the enemies manage to shift them onto you, then you, you're right to go after them with binding and loosing and with spiritual warfare to get rid of those burdens and carry only the burdens that God has given you. And to let the oppressed go free. That oppressed one might be you. It might be your family. Or it might be in your church. It may be in your nation. But you see, do you see how this, this fits any situation? But what is God interested in? He's interested in setting people free. The same thing Jesus announced when he started his ministry over there on the wall. The scripture he quoted from Isaiah. The same one. The Lord had anointed him to preach good tidings. And to the meek, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of prison to those that are bound. Isn't this the same, same general thing here? And he said, the fast I have chosen for you is one that will bring to bear the power of God to undo the bands of wickedness, to loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke in other words, he wants all the fetters broken away. You ever get tired of the fetters you have? Did you see around others that you love? Now see, the chosen fast is one of the means that God has ordained to use to break this thing. The fast zeroes in and puts extra spiritual pressure to add to binding and loosing and other means of warfare we found to be effective. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. What's he saying here? He said, well, it looks like he's feeding them and putting them in the house. Yes, right. But you know, the physical needs of a person are not nearly as agonizing as the spiritual needs, are they? Somebody who's hungry for bread, it doesn't take much to satisfy that. You can pitch him a loaf of bread and go on your way, right? Supposing he's hungry for the things of God. It takes a little more to get him fed, doesn't it? And bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. What a blessing that we have a place to bring people who've been cast out. How many people have stood up in their church here and said, my church kicked me out when they found out I was reading those books. And so I came here. Well, praise the Lord. There needs to be a place where people can come who've been cast out. For God ministers to them. The naked, that's people without clothing. But it could also be without proper spiritual clothing as well. And you need a place where you can help them be properly clothed covering and that you hide not thyself from thine own flesh in other words it's to be a family affair as well now then when all these things are operating together then verse 8 shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness go before thee the glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward wow as I read that, I noticed several things I've been needing. Did you notice something you've been needing? Let's look at that again. Do you need your light to break forth as the morning instead of being a sputtering little candle about to go... Your light to break forth as the morning. And your health to spring forth speedily. Oh, me, that one hurts, doesn't it? Health, speed... And notice where it comes from. By going God's chosen route and concentrating on the things that God is concerned about and doing the works of Jesus is what it amounts to. You realize that doing the works of Jesus is to evangelize, to get the gospel message to people, to deliver them from demon forces, and to heal the sick. And then all the charismatic gifts and all the supernatural gifts and miracles work to strengthen those three main thrusts. And do you realize 
that salvation, healing, and deliverance will meet the needs that he's, he addressed over here. Loose the bands of wickedness, uh, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, and break every yoke. Sounds suspiciously alike, doesn't it? Now, when we've done this, when we begin to move in this kind of ministry, then our light will break forth. Thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. In other words, on the rear, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. That's pretty good. You know, over in Baltimore, a lady came to me that I had met, oh, I guess a year ago. She had come to Philadelphia to one of the meetings. And she had a child who's a little boy who is extremely hyperactive. And she was going to have to lock him in, a, in an asylum because he was just unbearable, just a very little little fellow. Uh, I guess he was about seven, maybe, six or seven, but just an unbearable child. And uh, she happened to be a black lady, and she had, his daddy was a full-fledged witch and had run off and left them. But this child was bearing all the sins of the fathers. I'll tell you what, when I prayed for that child, I didn't have much faith. I'll tell you, if it had been walking on the water, I would have sunk for the little faith that I had that that child was going to get help because he was in bad shape. And when I prayed, I didn't pick up anything special. I did the things I knew should help him. But, you know, no lights came on in the ceiling, no lightning flash, no neon sign saying he's free, he's free, he's free, you've done it again or anything. Nothing like that, you know. <laughs> I just sat there, I went through and I... I went through the sins of the fathers, I cut ungodly soul ties, I bound and loosed, and, and the more I did it, the devil said, it's not doing a bit of good, he's just sitting there looking up in space. And I kept on, I thought, well, I don't know anything else to do, so that's what I'm going to do. And I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get any little crinkly feeling, uh, you know, no electricity jumped all over me saying, oh, the Holy Spirit's doing what you can't see. I mean, it was just dead. As far as feelings and, and anything happening and I felt almost guilty I thought well bless your heart and I inwardly I just said Lord we are so un we're just so stupid we don't know hardly anything here this poor woman comes and this child is desperately praying I'm doing everything I know to do and it's not enough and it reminded me to get back in my Bible and study some more I seek the Lord about more breakthroughs so we can get these people free but you know that lady, I hadn't seen her. That was in Philadelphia about a year ago. Last night, and uh, well, all three nights, she was there. And she was right over there helping me. With uh, some ladies I was working with. And I was telling one of them, well, you be, I didn't, I thought I'd seen her before, but I couldn't remember. And uh, I was talking to one of the ladies about binding and loosing, what she could do after she left there. And this lady spoke up and said, yes, sir. Said, you do exactly what Pastor said. She said, a year ago, said, Pastor, you remember when I came to you? And I thought, no, you know, you know, Pastor in his blank mind. And uh, she said, well, I did. And said, you prayed, prayed for me and you prayed for my boy. And she told this lady, she said, listen, for six months I went through hell, binding and loosing. But Pastor told me to do that and I stuck to my guns said, this boy is now in a Christian school. He's making A's. He's on the honor roll. He still has some problems, but he's so much better. Before, I was going to have to put him in an institution. That's how bad he was. He couldn't learn. And now they say he's a brilliant child. And she said, but I had to do what Pastor said. I bound and loosed every day. I fought with those demons. And I almost thought I'd pull my hair out at times. It was so bad. But she said, it works. And said, Pastor, you tell people everywhere it works. If you'll do it. Said it took six months. But said, oh, it's worth it. Said now he's in a Christian school making A's. He's doing so so tremendously well. And though he has some other problems, they're, they're just minor compared to the way he was before. He was just a total wreck. And I thought, well, thank you, Father. And the Lord said, see, 
you don't have to have goosebumps for me to work. You know, don't you like to be working and have the goosebumps, you know? And I felt that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but every once in a while, and, and there's nothing especially wrong with that, but uh, a lot of times God just does something just because it's in the name of Jesus and because you're doing what you're supposed to do, and then he turns around and slaps you in the face with it and said, See, didn't need your goosebumps to make it work. That might have made you feel better, but I felt fine about the way it was. So it was really encouraging. And that's one of the things about traveling around and then occasionally people come here who've been uh, contacted by the books or something else. We had a, a big contingent of people from uh, Washington, D.C. who came over every night. They came and brought a lot of people over. And, there's a, and they were coming up and hugging my neck and saying, thank God for those books. When we got those books, that's what, that's what zeroed us in. So we called your church and you told us to come here to Brother John's Fellowship, and that's what we've been doing. We've been learning, and we're busy binding and loosing. We're busy casting out demons over at our place. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I know that doesn't make the Church Gazette record high headlines, you know. But I'll tell you what, it, makes, it rings God's bell because his people are getting help. The mothers, the fathers, the children are getting help, and that's what it's all about. And I'm satisfied that we're only hearing just a little sprinkle here and there about the people that are getting help. Because we get calls and letters all the time from people who've been saying, well, I should have written you or called you a long time ago, but my life was completely transformed. When I got a hold of one of your books, I read one of those testimonies, and I thought, wow, that sounds like me. And I read more closely, and I began to do what was in those books, and I got to reading the books and got to moving on the Scripture principles, and my life was completely changed. And I want to thank God for you and for that church for standing past. It does pay to stand, people. I know the devil tries to make you think sometimes it's not doing any good. He gets me down and tromps me with that every once in a while. I said, it's not doing a bit of good work. I said, you worked all these years and you had not got nothing. He comes at you, you know, well, nobody's recognized you. Well, I don't know what you'd want to be recognized for. I'll tell you who recognizes me. The enemy. Every time I meet one of them, they I know you. I mean, a lot of people don't know me, but I'll tell you what, I never met a demon that didn't know me. They already been, they'd already been clued in. They knew exactly who I was, what I was there for. <laughs> I'm persuaded they know about you, too. And I'll tell you what, if you're looking for to be known, that's about as well as any, you know, because... I don't even know how many demons there are. There's more demons than there are people. If you really want to be well known, if, you, if all the people in the world knew about you, that wouldn't be too many. But if the demons all know about you, that's more. So if you're just looking for sheer numbers, you know, of persons to know about you, you better, uh, better just go in the fight and, and get a name as a demon fighter, and then they'll all know about you. If that's what you're really interested in. Really, it doesn't matter, does it? We're supposed to be soldiers. And the wonderful thing is that our light will bring, break forth as morning, our health spring forth speedily, righteousness shall go before us, and the glory of the Lord will be on the, on the backside here, backing us up. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Oh, you mean I have to go through all this rigmarole first? That's what it looks like, doesn't it? He said, then, after you've gone through my chosen fast, after you've gotten involved in what I want, I find churches, Christians, and preachers going about trying to do the work of God. Oh, they're going to do things for God. The trouble is they won't do things God doesn't want done. It reminds me of the, a little, of the Boy Scouts. You know, they're, they're supposed to do a good deed every day. And one little boy came in with his buddy one time and he said, well, did you boys do your good deed for the day there, Scott Master? And he said, yes, sir. He said, we both helped that little old lady across the street. He said, well, it shouldn't have taken both of you to help one little old lady. He said, yeah, but she didn't want to go. <laughs> so it took both of them to drag her. And that's sort of the way it is with people doing God's work, I'm afraid. Sometimes they're trying to do what God doesn't want done. But in his chosen fast, you'll get your focus on the things God wants done. 
and you begin to move in harmony with what God is doing, I begin to understand what God considers important. I begin to think like he thinks, and then guess what? It causes my light to break forth as morning, my health to spring forth speedily, and my righteousness go before me, and the glory of the Lord to be all shining around. My, that's simplicity itself. There's nothing complicated about that, is there? Next time you go through those verses, you'll see it just as clear as a bell. It's all written right there, isn't it? Trouble is, it's a little too clear, isn't it? You know, uh, it gets embarrassingly clear when you study the Word of God. Uh, you dissolve the mystique, you know. Well, I don't understand what it says. Well, when that's swept away, then every time you read it, you think, ooh. Well, I know what to do. I just haven't been doing it. Now, he says, then after this, thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Why is it that you can call after you've been through this, and God can answer? Because your desires have been lined up with his. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires thine heart. And a lot of people grab that and say, oh boy, that's what I've been looking for. <laughs> that's how I'm going to get my new car. <laughs> Well, let me see. How do I delight myself more? Well, I go to church every time. I'll kneel when I pray. That's a little more holy. Um, I'll be careful. Raise my hands when they're saying. Uh, and, you, and you pick up a lot of little religious doodads, you know, that you're going to do to impress God, that you're delighting yourself in Him. Now, when you delight yourself in the Lord, that's when you begin to find understanding of what He's like and who He is and what He wants to do. And then he begins to share with you the burden on his heart to loose those bands of wickedness. To drop those heavy burdens off. To set the captives free. And then when you begin to move and you, your heart begins to move in harmony with his, then you find yourself crying out to him and he's able to answer because you're crying out for things that he wants. You say, well, what about the material things? Oh, they'll come along too, but you'll be kind of shocked. Oh, Lord, you didn't have to do that. He said, I know. But you're delighting yourself in me, and I'll take care of these other things. Isn't that what he said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. And he says, you'll call, and the Lord will answer. You'll cry, and he shall say, here am I. If thou take away from thee, uh, from the midst of thee, the yoke, Putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. Oh dear, here comes wanting us to repent. Just when it was getting interesting. What does he want us to do? He wants us to take away the, the, the yoke. Putting. Did you ever come to church because you were duty bound? Oh, I don't feel like going, but I'm just duty bound. I'll tell you, it's a sad thing to look out and see a bunch of duty-bound ones sitting out there. They drag in, you know, and say, here I am. I don't want to be here, but it's my duty. You've got to get those bondage of duty off of them first. You may come in not feeling well, just saying, I don't feel like it, but I know this is where I belong. And, I, and the next thing you know, God's going to pick up your spirit and the spirit of heaviness lift off of you, replaced with the spirit of praise and thanksgiving to God. Putting out forth of the finger, oh, that's finding out what's wrong with everybody else. Well, I can just put my finger on exactly what's the matter, and over here, that's the matter, and that's the matter. That's putting forth the finger, and um, speaking vanity. He's just going to restrict the way we talk. We're not supposed to be speaking vain things. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. People, we've seen this in a small way in this tiny church. Did you know that? We've seen an object lesson of this very thing. If you draw out your soul to the hungry, we've had people come to this church starving. For something of God, something they couldn't find. 
satisfy the afflicted soul when you re when you relieve the bondage take out the demons and get that person on their way now what happens your light shall rise in obscurity 14 years ago nobody had ever even heard of the Hegwish Baptist Church except maybe the community of Hegwish very few people knew there was such a place did you know today there are hundreds of people scattered all over this country and even all over the world who know there's such a place? The light rose in obscurity. You know why? Because we concentrated imperfectly. I'm sure not as well as we ought to have. But however badly we did it, we moved to relieve the bondage and to break the bondage off of God's people and to set them free in Jesus' name and teach them God's word. I was the pastor, the people prayed for me and supported me and backed me, and because of that, the light rose in obscurity. And now there are hundreds of people who know there is such a place here. There are hundreds of people who thank God every day that there is a place here called Heckwich Baptist Church. Because they either came here or through the books and tapes they receive or the meetings, they receive their help to get them on their feet to get their family started on its way to walking with God. And so many, there's so many of them, thank God. Now, is that tooting our own horn? No. When we started out, we had no intention of anybody knowing anything. We were just busy doing the work that had been set before us to do. That's all I did. I don't claim anything special. I prayed for revival. I certainly never knew it was coming this way. I'd have probably backed out. I mean, I, uh, I was a Baptist, and I knew how revival was supposed to be. They're supposed to be nice and lovely and, and all this. And I didn't know it was kicking, spitting, snorting demons was going to be the uh, way the thing was going to come about. So God didn't bother to tell me. He just led me on into it until I got so deep in the water that wasn't in turning back. And I've told you before, when, they, when an airplane leaves Los Angeles going to Hawaii, they have enough gas enough fuel to get there and just a little bit to spare and there is a place out over the Pacific Ocean by the way if you ever fly over there from the time you leave California till you get to Hawaii there is nothing but water under there I mean they're just they're not a speck of anything down there and uh, you get out a little over halfway there and you have gone past the point of no return what that means is there's not enough fuel in those tanks to get back to the mainland, the only way you can do is go straight ahead for Hawaii because that's the only thing out there. If you tried to turn around, you'd never make it back. And see, by the time I found out what this was all about, my tanks were over half empty. I was already past the point of no return. I didn't have enough fuel to get back to the safety of the denominational pen. Theological absoluteness and glorious, wonderful messages, anointed. And I really didn't want to go back anyway because everything I saw was up ahead and still is. We're still pressing toward that mark of the high calling. That's to do what Jesus wanted done. He wants the captives set free. He wants to loose them. He wants to get them saved, but don't stop there. Loose them from demon power get their bodies healed, get their minds fixed up, get the flow of the gifts moving in amongst them, and in a spiritual fellowship that the whole body will minister. This is one thing that the Lord showed me in the very early days, that everybody in the whole body was to minister. And I have fought with people all these years who wanted to shut it down and put special anointed ones to do it all and let the rest of you sit back there in the pews and mold run over you and God kept telling me no all the people are supposed to be involved everyone who's willing oh everyone that thirsteth come to the waters there's work for the women there's work for the children there's work for the men work for the boys all those who are willing can be involved well if you draw out your soul to the hungry satisfy the afflicted soul the right light rises in obscurity and thy darkness is the noonday and though we were hidden in obscurity, God has raised it up so people know everywhere there is a bomb in Gilead. 
And not only that, that's not to our credit because it's all what God did anyway. But when they come here, they can marvel at what God has done. And they go forth encouraged, strengthened, and believing that God can do it where they are too. Because if he did it for us, he doesn't love them, us any better than he loves them. And what he's done for us, of course, he can do for them and will. Well, he said, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? You want God's guidance on your life? You come through that chosen fast. That's how you get there. And satisfy thy soul in drought. In the dry seasons, your soul will be satisfied. And make fat thy bones, that thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Isn't that encouraging? We're laying the foundation for something far greater that God wants to do. And we're doing it, we're just finding out why God led us this way. Didn't start out saying, I'm going to be the repair of the breach. No, no. You do the works of Jesus, and then you find out that's what it's leading to. And look what's going to happen. They which shall be of thee, that's all our natural children and our spiritual children, all of those who have taken encouragement and help and blessing because they came here or because they read in the books or they heard on the tapes or they came to the meetings and heard and began to believe God and moved out into ministry those that be of thee we got a lot of spiritual youngins running around do you know that and they're giving the devil a fit the ones that are sticking by the staff this is why you should stay close to the deliverance fountains because this is what it's all about people you build up the old waste places are there old waste places oh everywhere Places are in, in just falling down. Spiritually, it's a wreck. It's a ruin out there. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Thank God. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking after thine own words, well, how boring. I don't get to do nothing I want. Isn't that what he said? Look at it. Honor him, not doing thine own ways, finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. That sounds like a raving fanatic. Doesn't it? He said, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride on the high places of the earth. You want to have high experiences with God? There's no great mystery about it. You go through sacrificial living. You lay your life on the altar. You don't hear much about that today, do you? You can turn on the TV and radio and in vain to hear them say, they'll be saying, hey, you better not do this or you'll go to hell. That makes it more holy when you hick on the end. It means the Spirit's got you. I tell you, brother. I've heard them hick. I just wanted to run and give them a glass of water or something. I might just throw it in their face to see if we bring it out of them. But actually, if you go through these simple things that God wants done, He will begin to produce all this in and through us. Isn't that encouraging? It isn't some spectacular, mysterious secret hidden somewhere. It's a matter of just doing the works of Jesus, finding out what God wants done, and then going his way. And when you do that, he begins to put all these things into motion inside of you, inside of me, inside of the church. And you can delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll cause them to rise on the, ride on the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Is that worth going for, people? Is that worthwhile? It sounds good to me. It sounds hard. I don't know why he wants to be so picky about it. 
That's why there's not many people on the road. Most of the people want to go this other route. They want to think to go their own way. They want to think their own thoughts. They want to say their own words. But he says, when you move into this, going through my chosen fast, and you get under the burden that I am burdened with, you begin to be concerned about the people and the conditions that I'm concerned about, then you begin to have all kinds of marvelous things happen to you as a consequence. Let me ask you this. Can you outgive God? Why don't you try? Have a giving contest. You uh, Try to outgive God and see what happens. Just give him your time. Give him some of your time. The best way to do it is start out with some time you can't spare and take that and give that to the Lord for prayer Bible study. Just say, Lord, I can't spare this time. But I believe, and, and you say, oh, well, I don't know when I'd find an hour. I'm talking about five minutes or ten minutes. Start with five minutes. Pretty soon you want to enlarge it to ten. You can't ever tell. You might get beef real fanatical before it's over with. And just let God speak to you and lead you into the works of Jesus. The Bible is a guidebook. It's not meant to be filled with mysteries that you can never understand. I can never translate there are mysteries here, sure. But our everyday walk with Jesus, I haven't said anything tonight that was complicated or difficult, have I? And I didn't make it up. It's right there in the scriptures. And you'll find that when you go home, you read that over again. You say, yeah, you know, that's what that preacher said. And it's right there. Praise the Lord. It is there. See, that's the beauty of studying the scripture together because then, you, then when you go back over it again, it says the same thing. And then about time you think you've got it, that section all wrung out with all the beautiful truths that are blessing your heart, you read it through again, and here comes a fresh spark on you. say, hey, hey, what was that? Oh, there's another one back up there. There's another truth, a little nugget hidden back up on there. Because you'll never, you'll never exhaust this word. Praise the Lord. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, wouldn't you like to? He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, would you like to? You can just say, Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Now, if he's not in your heart, he'll come in. If he's already there, he'll tell you why you're confused. You say, well, supposing I did that, though, and nothing really happened, nothing was really changed. Well, then uh, come forward, and uh, there'll be workers here at the front, and just tell one of them, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. And they'll assign some worker to you to sit down with the Word of God, Go over God's plan of salvation and see if that's what you're trusting in, what you're resting in for your help, for your blessing. If it is, you can know and quit doubting and quit fearing. If it's not, you can get on that plan of salvation tonight and be saved. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses your spiritual growth and progress, then by all means, you need to seek help and deliverance from evil spirits. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. This is why we do it. And there are many, many workers here who can help you and get you some help in the areas where you're being driven, harassed, tormented, and compulsive behavior as a result. And this will slow you down, stop you, or even reverse spiritual growth and progress. If you want to get rid of that sort of thing, by all means, come. You say, well, I came up for prayer a couple of times and nothing happened. Well, do you still have your problem? Yes, I do. Well, then all, you, all that happens, you came up a couple of times and nothing happened. If it's really bothering you, I'd keep coming until I got results. If it doesn't bother you that much, well, don't bother to come until it gets to bother you. I was talking to a young man last night. He came up to me and he said, Now, I don't know whether I have any demons or not. I don't know whether these people have demons or not. They were screaming, flipping all over the floor and everything else, and vomiting and everything else. And he didn't know for sure whether they because he'd been to Bible school. I said, Lord, give me strength. And because uh, I didn't feel very nice at the time. I said, well, do you think all these people are putting on? All I'd done was read a list of demons and then they started acting funny. Command them to come out in Jesus' name. And he said, well, I don't know. And he said, I don't know whether I have a demon or not. I said, well, I expect you better go then and find out. And I said, I got in line with 15 people waiting for prayer that know they've got them. And son, I can't sit here and, and uh, spend time trying to can argue with you about whether the demons are real, whether you've got them. I said, as a matter of fact, if you want to know, you've got a load of them. 
a bunch of religious ones especially. He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I do. I've been in the business a while. I said, you, you're loaded. And uh, <laughs> he, he didn't care for that too much. I said, but son, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. I said, the books are out there. If you're really interested in knowing about this, go get the books. You're a student. Sit down and read it. Check it with the scriptures and find out. And I said, maybe if you can get back to a deliverance worker before the demons drive you crazy or kill you, just pray you'll be able to get back to one just in time. I said, they'll convince you you're, they're real. Well, the preacher got a hold of him later and bounced and hit the pastor and the pastor really fixed him up. He said, well, I don't think I have any demons. He said, oh, I, I get trouble with lust during the day, but that's just my flesh. He said, well, if you don't have any demons, maybe it's, maybe it's coming from your wife, your one flesh, you know. He didn't like that. And, uh, but it's so pitiful when people won't admit they have problems. They don't want to admit it. They've come out of these churches where you, you have to be so holy, you mustn't mention that you've got a problem. A well, friend, listen, you're in a place where we understand everybody's got problems. And we're all beginning to be. We're not, we haven't arrived, none of us. So you're in a good place. You can come and admit you've got a problem and nobody will think anything but say, well, praise God, let's see if we can get some help. I've been in churches where you didn't dare confess you had a problem. You'd mess up the fellowship. Everybody's supposed to be perfect. They lie, you know. They learn how to be liars, cover up. But in Deliverance Church, you can just let your hair down and be yourself and say, I've got a real problem. And then there'll be somebody who'll care and will give you some help. So if you need help, by all means, come. Another sign that follows believers is that you'll speak with new tongues. If you've never received this gift from the Lord since you were saved, it's yours. You say, well, I was taught against that. I was too. But it's a gift from the Lord. And Jesus never gave a gift that wasn't worthwhile. And I'm so glad I found out about it. You could find out about it tonight. Somebody would share with you. And if you're interested, pray with you. You say, well, I don't want anybody to make me speak in tongues. Oh, I hope not. Then we have to throw it out of you. You don't make people speak in tongues because if you, if you did that, you'd put an evil spirit in them, false tongues. Then it had to be thrown out of you. No, this is a gift you receive from the Lord. And you can't receive it unless you want it. The Lord's not going to force himself on you. But there are people here who could share with you and help you to understand about it. If you want it, they can pray for you to receive it, help you with it. Another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you have physical needs, by all means, come. Let's stand, sing something about that name. <laughs>